this section, we'll talk about solving linear systems by graphing. Before we actually start talking about that subject, though, let's talk about what it even means to solve a linear system. So thus far, if you're in an Algebra 1 class and you're progressing through the year and you've gotten to this type of section, so far what you've been able to do with linear equations is they either had one variable, so you're able to solve that equation by getting the variable by itself, and you most of the time got a number answer like x equals 2, or we've had equations where we've had two variables that all we've been able to do really is solve for y and graph that equation. And this is going to lead us to a new concept where if we have more than one equation and they're both representing lines, then we can talk about an important thing that happens with those two lines. What I mean by that is if you think about two lines, and if I just kind of draw two random lines somewhere, if I were trying to think like a mathematician and think about what the important thing happening here is, the place that I probably care about the most is this place where the two lines are intersecting. So that is the whole point kind of, of a system of equations is this idea that we care where our two lines are equal. And that doesn't mean that we're gonna graph every single one. We can um, algebraically come up with where they're equal, but today the method we're gonna go over is going to involve us actually looking at graphs. So the idea is that we have a system of equations, which is, the word system is just a fancy word in math, at least, that means group. Our system uh, just means that there's more than one of them. So if you have just one equation, you wouldn't call it a system, but you could have two or three or four or five or uh, as many equations as you want, and we would call that a system. We're gonna focus in this chapter on solving linear systems. So if you've gone farther than algebra one before, you will already know some other types of things we can graph other than lines. So in this section, we just care about our linear, our linear, our lines, whatever you call them. We just care about lines and our systems are gonna be in two variables, which implies that yes, we could talk about this with three variables or four variables and so on. What happens is every variable we add makes our lives more complicated, sort of, because once we get to a certain number of variables, the technique we use to solve those doesn't necessarily actually get that much harder when we add more variables. It might take longer, but there's also a point in doing this where we would just say, I'm gonna let the computer help me with this. Anyway, but these are not gonna be too bad, don't worry. And before we actually talk about graphing them, let's talk about how to check our answers. This whole chapter seven, or if you have a similar chapter in your book where we're talking about graphing systems of equations and solving systems of equations, we're gonna get these answers that are this. And our question might be these two equations we have on the side. And so what we do to check our answer to see if one comma two is really the answer to the system of equations is we could plug this back in and see if it works. Because if one comma two is the place where these two lines, these two equations, when I plug one and two in for X and Y respectively, then I should get true statement. And we did something similar to this when we were dealing with just regular equations. Uh, so this should seem kind of similar. So we would do two times one plus two equals four. Two times one is two and two plus two is four. We would look at that and say, hey, that's true, four equals four. So it works for the first equation. But we do have to check both of them. Well, we have to check both of them if one of them works. If the first one didn't work, we could stop and say, oh, well, I already know it won't work. Since the first one worked, we have to do both. So five times one is five, five minus two is three. Three does in fact equal three. And so since they are both true, could say that yes, it is a solution. The other possible answer is that, or situation, is that one or both of them might not work. And so if that's the case, we'd stop and say, no, it's not a solution. Now I know for my students personally, some of them don't like showing work 
And on a problem like this, might try to get away with just saying yes or no and doing this in their heads. And uh, I am not okay with that personally, at least not in Algebra 1, because it's important that we practice algebraically showing things. And so what I'm writing right now, where I'm plugging negative 2 and 4 into this equation, this is my way of algebraically proving that what I'm saying is true instead of just saying, oh, well, I think that it's yes. Or actually, we can say with confidence, if we've done this right, we can say with confidence that, oh, yes, this really is a solution, or no, it's not a solution. The first equation worked, so let's check the second equation. That, that whole spiel was just to say, you should show your work. Teachers like when you show your work. We get negative 6 minus 8, which since they're both negative, negative sign. Negative 14 does not equal 2. So the first one worked, but the second one didn't. And all that matters is that one of them didn't work. So this would be, no, it is not a solution. Make sure when you're writing your answer, like this is kind of a personal thing to me, like the instructions say to decide whether the ordered pair is a solution of the system of linear equations. And it may be that you think this is acceptable to say yes or no on, I think it warrants more of a response of, yes, it is a solution, no, it's not a solution, but we definitely would not want to write on either of these no solution because we're only picking one point or someone has picked one point for us to try. Um, so negative two, four is not a solution to part B here, but that doesn't mean that there's not a solution at all. There probably is a solution and if we actually go through and solve it, we could figure out what that is. It just so happens the one they picked for us to try didn't work. So no solution is not at all a correct answer. You'd say not a solution. Or maybe if your teacher's okay with it, you could just say no. Now that we talked about basically the concept of what a solution is, it's the point where they're intersecting or the point where our two equations are equal, there's actually three different ways that we can solve these linear systems. We can solve them by graphing, substitution, and the third way has many names. One is linear combinations, one is elimination, and then I've also seen it called the addition method. Um, and I don't know why it has so many different names. Technically, all three of those names have a way of helping us know what that method is. If you're new to this concept of solving system of equations, is that we could use any of these three methods to solve any problem. Usually, there's one way that will stick out as easiest to us, either because we just feel the most confident, or when we look at the system, we can say, Oh, I can totally tell how to solve it this way right off the bat. Unfortunately, when we're learning the three ways, we have to actually focus on that way right at that moment. Um, and then later on in your math career, you will be allowed to just pick which way you like the best. But so for now, like this section is about solving by graphing. So we want to graph every single answer that we have. Speaking of graphing, we've got two form, which is very helpful. So remember that to graph in slope intercept form, we start with the number not attached to x. That's our y intercept. So we go to negative four on the y-axis. Then our slope, if it's not a fraction, we turn into a fraction by putting it over 1. So 5 over 1 is our slope. We rise the top number and we run the bottom number. And since they're since it's a positive 5, we want them either to both be a positive direction or both to be a negative direction. In this case, since we're starting at negative 4, it makes the most sense to go up 5 and right 1. There are other cases where down five left one might be more helpful. We want to, if it's possible to put a lot of points, we the more points you can put, the better. This one, we just can't fit a whole bunch of points on our graph, but if we could fit more, we would try to. On this second one, we have uh, three as our y-intercept and negative two as our slope. So we're going to start up here at 3 and then go down 2 and right 
because one is positive. If I have a negative number, only either the top or the bottom is negative, not both. But either think of this as down and to the right, or I could think of it as up and to the left. I could think of it as both of those as well. Um, but when I'm done with this, it should be going down and to the right. And as soon as I made my second point here, I was on top of a point I had drawn for the other graph. Sorry about this extra little line. Drawing lines on a computer is actually pretty difficult and much better in real life, trust me. So as soon as I had this point of intersection, I didn't necessarily need to draw a whole bunch more points, but if I had needed to draw more points, I would have. This point where they're meeting is one comma one. And so that would be our answer. Now, in this problem, you might look at this and say, oh, that's great. I didn't have to show like any work to do this. Your work in this problem is the graph that you're doing, because without it, we couldn't say, oh, yeah, I solved this by graphing. So your work is the graph. Your answer is the point. And, and I would say that most teachers, if not all teachers, will want you to make sure that you have both of those in order for you to get full points. In the next two examples, it's just kind of more of the same, although in this example, for instance, we visit what do I do when it's y equals negative 4. So if it's been a while since you've graphed, um, you'll be able to remember what this is. This is a horizontal line because in order for us not to have an x, we're saying that we have zero slope. So zero slope is where a ball on a line would not go back because it's a horizontal line, a true horizontal line, not like a table that's not level and your ball, your ball rolls off of or your pencil rolls off of. The other way, um, and I this might be better for some of you, is if we're saying y equals negative 4, we're saying that we have all the points where our y value is negative 4. So you could fill in some numbers for your x value like 0. 0, negative 4 is right here. 1, negative 4 is right here. 2, negative 4. And once you notice your pattern here, that gives us a horizontal line. And that is different than if we had x equals negative 4. That would be a vertical line because it would be all the places where we have negative 4, comma, some unknown quantity. The second equation here, we're going to solve for y. And solving for y typically requires two steps. First, moving your x over to the other side. Usually that means subtracting, although occasionally we'll have a negative x at the beginning and have to add. Okay, so you just do whatever is opposite, right? This is positive 4x, so I subtract 4x. So that I have negative y equals negative 4x minus 4. Those don't go together because they're not like terms. One has an x and one does not have an x. And then my second step usually is to divide by what's in front of y. In this case, what's in front of y is a negative or a negative 1. So I want to divide both sides and get y equals 4x plus 4. So I start at 4. This is where it's really e it can be really easy to mess up because I know that this is a positive slope, so I should go up 4, right 1. But I don't have room to do that. And this is where out for one students will make uh, a, tr a real easy mistake is that when they go the other direction, they'll go down four, which is correct, but then they'll go the wrong direction. So when we need to go the other direction from instead of positive four and positive one, what we're doing is we're making both negative because that's the only way for us to not change the number. It's a positive four. So I can't just make the top negative or just the bottom negative. It means I'm going to go down 4 and left 1, not right 1. Okay, 4 and right 1. If I had room, that would be up here. We want to do the exact opposite of that. We want to go down 4 and left 1. And if it helps you to make a point up here so that you know that you need to go the opposite way, then do that. Because it would be really easy to mess that up and still get a, a point of intersection that's almost right, but, you know, almost isn't good enough. 
for math most of the time. So these do intersect down here at negative two, negative four. And we did have to keep going. Uh, like the first point wasn't far enough. So we needed to keep drawing points until we actually made our lines intersect. So you wouldn't just draw part of it and then say, oh, there's not a solution. They don't intersect. You keep drawing until you get to a point of intersection. Um, there is an, a time that they would not intersect, and that would be if you had two parallel lines. That's not going to happen in our notes today. Um, when we're in Algebra 1, sometimes that will be saved for a later section, and that is the case for us, that later on we'll talk about special cases like that where it has to do with them being parallel lines or something else. On example 4, I... Uh, if you have not already thought about doing this, you might pause the video and try this on your own and then restart the video so that you can see if you got it right. We need to solve both of these for y, which means moving the x over. Remember that we don't just move the x um, by like picking it up and placing it on the other side. We actually have to subtract it. Then we divide by negative 1, kind of like what we've done in the last one. So y equals x plus 2. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the next one, except I don't have to divide by a negative. I just get y equals negative x plus 4 almost right off the bat. When I graph this first one, I have 2. The slope here in front of x, since there's not a number, is 1. It's not 0. 0 would mean we didn't have an x at all. It would be 1, so up 1 over 1. And it may be frustrating to put a whole bunch of points here. But I personally find that if I don't put enough points on my first line and have to go back and put them, that's, that's annoying to me. It may just be because I'm a math teacher, but, but trust me, it is easier to put them initially than to have to go back and put them. So that was a positive slope, and positive 2 is our y-intercept. Our other line is at positive 4. And it's negative 1, so we need to go down 1 right 1 or up 1 left 1. So that's going to intersect right here, right next to where we're at. So it just so happens we didn't need all those points on this one. We had no way of knowing that until we actually graph these lines. So this point where they intersect is 1 for x, 3 for y. Remember that x comes before y when we write our points. So it's 1, 3. Now... This next slide I have has just a list of steps that you can use so that when you go to do a problem like this, examples like what we've got are helpful. But it can also be really helpful to have steps so that you can say, I have no idea what to do. Let me look at this. Step one, solve both equations for y. Well, I can do that. So you do that and then look at the next step. The next step is to graph both equations, draw as many points both directions as possible. Because again, the more points we draw initially, the less we'll have to go back and try to uh, figure out where points we're supposed to go. And the final step is to find where the lines cross. That is the solution. So three steps on these problems, um, which really, on some of them, it's only two, because sometimes you won't have to do step one, which is nice. So this has been 7.1, Solving Systems of Linear Equations by Graphing.